I'm the Hornet King, and I remove incredible and insane wasp nests. Whether their nests are underground, in a house, in a tree, or even down a well, I'm the person crazy enough to extract them, and I do so with my trusty vacuum. In this video, I'm going to be removing an eastern yellow jacket ground nest from a client's backyard, plus some long-awaited tweezing for you larvaholics out there, plus showing the stages of progression of a wasp from an egg all the way up to a pupating adult. Check it out. Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to check out this video. This is the removal of an eastern yellow jacket colony, or Vespula maculifrons, which is a subterranean yellow jacket species that I deal with pretty frequently here in PA. Um, but this particular nest was on, in the backyard of a client's house, right here by their basement stairs or their bilco doors. Um, the soil here is pretty sandy here in Maryland, and uh, which made a pretty easy access for the yellow jackets to dig a subterranean nest. Uh, you can see that there is a piece of Versalock block, which is a type of building block that we use in masonry. Um, that was here on the ground, and they were able to uh, to dig a colony underneath of that, and that's kind of suspended the surface so that way it wouldn't collapse on them. Uh, so typically with these kind of ground nests, I just pound on the ground and try to get as many of the workers and guards to escape as I possibly can in one shot. Um, but I, unbeknownst to me, this was a massive colony. I mean, there were just tons in there, and... As you'll see, I really didn't edit too much of the uh, too much of this part out where they're coming out of the entranceway. I just left it in there because I wanted people to see just how many of the numbers were in this nest. Um, Vespula maculifrons, or eastern yellow jackets, uh, for the layman terms, um, they are a, a type of yellow jacket species that latch on, similar to um, southern yellow jackets or Vespula squamosa. Um, they latch on and do not let go. You could spray you know, uh, some kind of insect spray or wasp spray on them while they're latched on and they will relentlessly not give up stinging you until they're pretty much dead. Um, so whenever I go in to do a ground nest, I pretty much just assume it's going to be either um, eastern yellow jackets or southern yellow jackets and just kind of prepare myself mentally to be latched on and attacked vigorously. Um, so usually what I do is I kind of like add extra padding to my suit, like especially around the knees, joints, um, elbows, wrists, just because when they latch on, they don't let go. And if your clothing gets pulled taut around your skin, um, it gives it gives a weakness to the clothing and the suit, and um, they can sting you through it. Now, this is actually my old suit, which you'll know that in my more recent videos. I've, you've been seeing me in my um, breathable mesh suit, and that one is, is extremely well protected from stings because it's got three layers to it. Uh, this older suit is basically just like a glorified jumpsuit or like, you know, blue collar suit uh, with a hood on it. And uh, the fabric's pretty thin, just a thin cotton fabric. So I always have to wear like insulated sweatpants and um, sweaters underneath of it. With, with the new breathable suit, I don't have to do that. So there's a big wolf spider walking by there. It's a wolf spider or a Hammond spider. I'm not. I'm not positive. They kind of look a lot very similar to each other. Uh, so what I do is I just let the vacuum kind of just sit there and just run. And the foragers that are coming back and the guards that had escaped kind of swarm around. So I just kind of let the vacuum sit there at the entranceway and just suck up as many as I can. Um, at certain points, I actually just kind of step back and just let the vacuum run for a little while and try to get the swarm down. Um, if I sit there, they'll just keep swarming around me, but if I get up and kind of stand back, they'll go back to the entranceway. Uh, so I moved that Versalock block out of the way and just tried to uh, locate exactly where the nest was, um, even though I knew it was pretty much going to be underneath that block. I didn't know how far around the perimeter of that block it still was. So poking a hole here in the top of the soil, I put my finger right through the top of the nest. So that's obviously where I wanted to start um, removing as much of the um, much of the soil as possible to expose the top of the nest. Uh, but once I started doing that, even though I had been vacuuming for at least 25 minutes of the entranceway, look how many are still coming out of this nest, even though I think I vacuumed up a lot of the the, uh, the workers and guards. Um, but that's the thing about these nests. You just never know how many you're going to be inside and you never really know how big it's going to be. So the nest, the size of this nest is pretty big. I mean, for a subterranean species, it's not the biggest one I've ever done, 
but it was a good size and the colony kind of helps me distinguish whether or not I'm going to call it a large nest, a huge nest, a massive nest. Um, it's not just the physical size of the nest. So this nest was probably about 10 inches long by about 12 inches wide um, and then probably about 5 inches deep. Um, and that's including the paper envelope that's inside the hole. Uh, when I pull these subterranean nests out, you don't get really get to see, see my whole hand there. You really don't get to see um, the entire nest as one big ball. You really just see the comb and the um, envelope separated. But anyhow, when I'd say a nest is a certain size, I'm also taking into account the colony size. So how many adults are in it, how packed with larvae is the nest, and that's how I determine whether or not I call it a massive nest or huge nest or... Um, whatever the other uh, adjectives that I use. Um, so this one I would say was a pretty huge to massive size nest, um, including the colony size, because there was probably about 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 individuals, and that includes larva, pupating adults, queen, and then all the workers and males and things. So as with any of my ground nests or subterranean species nests that I just kind of go around with the vacuum and suck up a lot of the soil. It doesn't hurt my vacuum to suck up the soil because there is a lot of water in the bottom so any soil that comes in pretty much hits that water and just kind of like turns into sludge so I don't have to worry about it getting into the filter or getting into the uh, which the filter in my shop vac is just a foam filter it's not a uh, particulate filter. Um, so I just vacuum up as much of the top of the nest and just try to expose it so that way when I do pull it up I can do that and expose it and not a bunch of soil falls into the bottom. So that way you guys get to see every aspect of the inside of this um, subterranean nest. Um, so what you're seeing there is actually the envelope. So as the workers build the nest they dig out a bunch of the soil and they just keep building envelope. Um, and then as the nest gets bigger, they tear down the inner layers of envelope, just like a bald-faced hornet or a European hornet. They tear down the inner layers of envelope and then use that cellulose material and recycle it to make the comb. And typically the comb is built at nighttime. Any of the nests that I've studied here at my house, including Vespa Crab Bro, which is a European hornet, um, anytime I watch those types of nests being built from, you know, at nighttime, they're building the comb at nighttime. So, I mean, they do build comb during the daytime too, but um, they use more of the cellulose that they tear down from the inner walls to build the comb. But just look at the size of that thing. I mean, it, that's pretty big. I mean, that's a pretty good sized nest. Um, not a lot of layers to it, just about five different layers of comb. So obviously they were still building it, but you could see that they were hindered to making the large circular comb by the concrete of the Bilko doors. So they, they weren't able to really um, make like one big uniform patty for each layer. Uh, so they kind of had to make like a, you know, kind of an oblong and slightly off-center style. Um, but yeah, so it went down into the into the soil there, and they were digging out around a lot of those pebbles and things. You can see a lot of smooth pebbles down in that hole, too. Um, so, and then underneath the envelope, you'll notice that there are a lot of males, and there are some new queens down there, but this was kind of earlier in the season, so not a lot of the new queens and males had hatched yet. So um, the ones that you would be seeing me suck out of the hole here are actually just excavators or workers that are digging the actual uh, or doing the actual excavating. So I just push in a lot of the soil as I can and just pack it in there. So that way any ones that are in there, I mean, it's pretty barbaric, but they, they get covered over and, uh, and, and they die under there. Um, and I try to fill in as much of the cavities as I can because you don't want foragers coming back and just kind of like hunkering down inside of the old cavity space. So I do try to put the block in there and just push around the sides so that way there isn't any like uh, any holes to go into. But I do poke a hole where the original entranceway was in the soil and just make it a dummy hole and I just let the vacuum sit there and suck up the returning foragers and, and guards. You can see that they're latched all over my arms, all over my gloves. And they just don't let go. I mean, they'll just sit there and keep stinging and stinging and stinging and stinging until I either smush them or pull them off. Um, but typically, if they're already embedded, you can see them on my veil and on my suit. But typically, if they're embedded into the leather with their stinger, they, it pretty much disembowels them when I pull them out. Uh, not because they have a barbed stinger like a honeybee, but just because that their stinger gets lodged in there. And, and they can actually sting in multiple different directions. Their stinger doesn't just come straight out of their abdomen. Like, it can come out at different angles, uh, which I've noticed in my, uh, my macro shots. So pretty interesting stuff. So I just let the vacuum run for about 15, 20 minutes and just until uh, most of the foragers and swarm kind of dies down. 
So I get the nest home, and as usual, I open up my little bin here and uh, and start vacuuming off the rest of the workers and things off the nest. Now, there weren't too many on there just because I had vacuumed up a lot and had really shook the nest up while I was there doing the removal. So not a lot of individuals were in between the layers. Um, I did not find the queen, per se, uh, but I think she had gone up into the vacuum while I was doing this. I did find the queen in the vacuum when I was finished. So just taking my time vacuum up as much as I can. I'm not too worried about the individuals that fly past me while I'm doing this because, I mean, they can't survive without the nest, and they have no idea where they are. They have no uh, point of reference as to where this nest has been relocated to. So even if they do fly out, they'll kind of stay around the table, and then they pretty much just die in a couple days. Sometimes I will come down here the following day after vacuuming up a lot of these nests, and I'll still see a couple flying around the table, but they're not aggressive because they have nothing to defend. Uh, their aggression and their uh, protection comes from the nest itself. So they're defending their food source, which is the, the larva, because they eat from the larva, as I mentioned in many, many, many videos. Um, but yeah, so they, they, be, they aren't nearly as aggressive once the nest has been removed from a location or they're removed from where, they, uh, where the nest used to be. For a lot of my larvaholic viewers, here is your much-awaited tweezing video. So I brought this nest inside and decided to tweeze out as much of the larva as I can. Um, so you'll notice that there's some of these nests that just have a lot of silk caps on them, which is the white that you're seeing. It almost looks like a bullseye. Um, those white parts are actually silk caps that the larva weave when they're ready to go into their metamorphosis state and turn into an adult wasp. So the larva themselves will weave that silk cap. It's basically like a paper by the time that it hardens. Um, people often ask what that feels like. It literally feels like a thin piece of paper, not quite tissue paper, maybe like printer paper. Um, but it's it's pretty it's pretty easy to uh, to tear it. But it's actually, I mean, the actual tensile strength of the thread is pretty impressive. Um, it doesn't rip like paper. It kind of like you have to tear it apart, and, and like little fibers get pulled apart. It's pretty interesting how it, how uh, the structure is. So the larva will weave that silk cap, and then underneath of there, it almost acts like an, a cocoon or a chrysalis, like for moths and butterflies. Um, it kind of creates like a little capsule for them to go through their metamorphosis into an adult wasp. So you notice that some of these patties have a lot more larva in them than, the, uh, than others. So depending on what part of the structure this nest or these combs are in the nest, um, there's going to be more larva in them. So as the nest progress, uh, the, or as the nest progresses, the bottom portions of comb, which most of them become queen comb, um, have a lot more larvae inside of them because that's where the queen's laying most of the eggs. So this is just some larvae that had fallen out of the comb. Uh, people often ask why I don't just flip the comb upside down and shake them and shake out the larva and things. Uh, they're actually attached inside the cells. So when a queen is laying an egg, she doesn't just you know poop an egg out and have it drop into the cell. Because if you, if you remember, the, the comb are actually upside down. So the, the opening to the cell is pointing downward. So if she just if she just plopped them out inside that cell, they would just fall out. Um, so she actually sticks them and, and adheres them to the inner bottom portion of the cell. So when the lar larvae are growing, they're still attached to the inside of that cell. It's not till they start going through their metamorphosis that they become detached. Um, I'm not sure at what point they become detached. Some of the um, the pupating adults, if they still if they still look kind of like larvae, but they have a few details to them, they'll still be attached. But if they're pretty well defined and they have legs and things, typically they're not attached anymore. So if I were to pull off all the silk caps and expose a bunch of pupating adults, I could flip the comb upside down, just shake it, and they would fall out. So I just take my time here tweezing out as many as I can um, because I'm going to feed these to the girls. Unfortunately, I do not have the footage of me actually feeding this large bottle of larva to the girls. Um, so you'll just have to do with the uh, with the feeding of the rest of the nest that I provided at the end of this video. Um, but I'm going to shut up and stop talking so that way you guys can enjoy the tweezing ASMR of this particular part of the video. Um, the noises that the nest makes, the larva sounds, the tweezing, it's, it's just, it's great. I really enjoyed putting this part of the video together. So enjoy the rest of my tweezing ASMR.
All right, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I wanted to show you guys the progression of an egg all the way up to a pupating adult. So this is the egg of the wasp. This is a yellow jacket egg that was laid inside of a cell that I ripped out. And then it eventually starts progressing into a larva. Now this larva, you can see, is still attached to the inside of the cell. I ripped the cell apart so that way you guys could see it from the inside. So you can see how she's stuck to the inside of that paper. And she'll do that. She'll be that way all the way up until she starts pupating. Um, you can see the respiratory system, um, you see little egg, air sacs in there, you can see the circulatory system, the fluctuation looks like a heartbeat, really impressive, wild stuff. Uh, you can see the head of the larva starting to form, so her mandibles are, are pretty, pretty well established at this point so she can process food. This is a larger larva, and I want to be able to pull this out so you can see a little bit more of the, uh, the a little bit opaque, but you can see through a little bit to see the air sacs. So the little white dots you're seeing are the air sacs of the larva, and as she, as her circulatory system works and her body is moving from the inside, that muscular movement is drawing in air to for her to process. There, you can start to see a lot of the circulatory system there. Really, really wild stuff to see that up close. Now I have some other um, shots of this where you can see like almost inside of the larva, um, but I wasn't really showing that as much as I wanted to show you guys the progression. So uh, if you guys want to see that, just drop in the comments. Let me know you want to see that. All right, so you can see right there, she this one's a little bit more developed. She's about to start weaving a silk cap. And once they start weaving a silk cap, they start developing like this into a pupating adult. So you can see some of the structures of the adult wasp are starting to form mandibles. And here the antenna are starting to form, but everything is very still, it's still very clear. Um, you can see through it pitty well. Um, but as it starts to develop, the, uh, the chitin, which is the protein um, exoskeleton, starts to form and harden. And that's when it becomes uh, less see-through. So this one here is a little bit less see-through than the previous uh, image that you saw. You obviously see the one next to it that has a lot of the chitin on it, um, which again is the protein that makes up the exoskeleton. So I just want to poke it a little bit. Some, you can see them move a little bit when you agitate them like that. Um, so they do have muscular movement. Um, and then this is another one that was pretty well advanced. Uh, she's not quite ready to come out yet, but um, once I pull off the, uh, the silk cap, you can see how this one is pretty well developed. This one would be just about ready to come out. Um, probably in another day or two, that one would have been chewing its way out. You can see all the hair on its head. You can see um, pretty much all the structures are there. Everything's well colorful. Yellow jackets start out completely black, and then their yellow starts to form and develop. So this is a eastern yellow jacket male that was starting to chew its way out. People will ask a lot about seeing... Um, shots from my nests where I shoot them coming out of the nest, chewing their way out. Um, so what happens is an adult female will chew a little tiny hole in the center of the silk cap, and then that gives a starting point for the newly hatching adult to start chewing the rest of the way out. If that little spot wasn't chewed out, it becomes very, very difficult for them to get out. Most of them can't get out and they'll die inside the cell. So this one you can tell is a male because it has longer, very jet black antennae. Um, females have shorter, straighter antennae, and when you see this male come out, the antenna kind of curve off to the side, almost looks like ram horns, so that's how you can kind of distinguish the males from the females. Plus, they do have a longer abdomen, they have an extra abdominal segment, along with an extra antennae segment. So I want to just include this and watch this uh, adult come plowing out of the cell, which is pretty cool to see. So you're seeing the birth of an adult wasp. So you got to see from the egg all the way up to this, this stage of development. So he will sit here and just wipe himself down for like 15, 20 minutes. And eventually he'll poke himself back down into a cell that has um, a larva inside of it and he'll get some sustenance. Mind you, this thing has not eaten since it was a larva about two and a half weeks prior to this. So that's a long time to go without food. Trying out his wings for the first time. Have to remember that this was a larva that had no legs, had no antennae, had no wings, nothing. So when it comes out of that cell, it has all these new things to move around and stuff. And somehow it knows how to do that. And in two days, it's flying and it can sting. Well, males can't sting, but females can. <laughs> so, so this is just a bald-faced hornet nest that I had sitting inside of the same box. So I was going to tweeze it out. And I'm just going to let you guys check out this tweezing segment of a bald-faced hornet with larger larvae um, and some uh, uh, time-lapse footage of that too.
I just wanted to show you guys a couple of little spots here where I pull off the silk caps and expose different stages of pupating adults. So this was a practically a fully formed yellow jacket. Um, she wasn't quite ready to come out yet on her own, but uh, obviously I forced her out. Um, this is a very early stage of pupating adult. This one doesn't have much of its chitin actually formed yet. Um, it's probably developing, but it's not actually fully formed. Same with this one. Um, you can pretty much just run a circle around geometrically around the nest in the same sequence of circles, and you can expose pretty much the same level of development each time all the way around the nest because the queen moves around and lays eggs in a, in a circle. So this is the, the, the catch of all the tweezing that I did in this one sequence. So that's a lot of larva for the girls to eat. So my animals eat all this larva. Um, if I was any other exterminator that just sprayed nests or dusted nests, um, all this material would go to waste and it would just die. And often people ask me why I feed the nest to my chickens and my animals is because this way it's the circle of life. So all of this stuff that would normally go to waste for any exterminator doing it, for me, it gets reused and my animals get to eat it. And there's a lot of protein, vitamins, minerals, and everything that's inside of these creatures and provides energy for my animals. Something else I wanted to show is that uh, people ask if larvae can bite. No, they cannot bite. Um, it just literally feels like you're being like lightly touched with like a feather. Um, their little mandibles are way too small to, to do any damage to your skin. And this is just a collection of nests that I brought home for the girls. And uh, so one including the nest that I was just tweezing and um, some extra European hornet nests and things. Uh, Humphrey was around, so everybody got to have a nice, a nice meal out of all these nests. Thank 
turkey. Come here, turkey. Come here, turkey. Hi, Yuzi. Oh, squirrel, squirrel. Are you gonna have some larvae, squirrel, squirrel? Some larvae, squirrel, squirrel. Are you like the European hornet, squirrel, squirrel? Eats for everyone. Eats for everybody. Watch that. She's not gonna put up with that. She's a bully squirrel. You don't mess with a bully squirrel. That's not Miss Emily. She's not afraid of you. <laughs> oh, she's pulling all the larvae out for you. Isn't that nice? She ain't gonna put up with that. After the nests are left over from my chickens, turkey, and a squirrel, the local wildlife get to have their share. So anything that's not eaten by my animals directly is then eaten by the wildlife that's nearby my house. We have a, a couple possums and about three different skunks. And they love to munch on the yellow jacket and hornet nests that I bring home. So this is one of my skunk buddies that um, likes to make its rounds at nighttime during the uh, on season of yellow jacket and wasp nest removals. and She's getting her fill right here, um, eating these nests. So this is about 12 o'clock at night, and you get to see this, uh, this cool creature munching down and getting its fill. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to check out this video. If you guys enjoyed this content, drop in the comments, let me know what you think. If you have any suggestions for future videos or something you'd see me cover in an upcoming video, also drop in the comments, let me know. I'm so excited. I designed some new merch using my new logo that was designed by an animator at the company Illumination who helped animate movies like Despicable Me and Ice Age. Eric, thank you so much for designing and creating this logo for me. I love the logo on my new merch, and a lot of my viewers have expressed some excitement over the new logo as well. So. I designed a bunch of new merch that's on my Teespring account, so if you click on my merch shelf down below this video, you can get to it. But if you're having trouble seeing, because sometimes on phones and other devices, uh, the merch shelf doesn't show up for whatever reason. So if you go to my main channel page and you click on the store tab, it should be there and you should see the Teespring account link. And click on that and that should take you to my Teespring store where you can find a lot of my shirts and things. Um, to find like the merchandise like mugs, sweaters, handbags, stickers, pants, leggings for some of you ladies, um, you have to click on a little tab that says Hornet King Merch and it just shows the icon of a bag. And you, for whatever reason, it's not very user friendly, but anyway, for whatever reason, you click on that and then that'll take you to all the other like little knick-knacky type things that I have that have like Hornet King and my logo on it, which I'm pretty excited about. I ordered a bunch of it last night and um, I can't wait to get it so I can support it on my next video. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to check out my videos, supporting my channel and my merchandise, and I'll catch you guys on the next video.